you a little bit today about your journey of a thousand days. That's about how long it is from the day you start law school to when you finish the bar exam. And then of course you get to collapse for a few days which takes you to the full thousand. But um, so it's a thousand days and when you think about it that's either a really lot or not so much. But it's a really, really major time in your life. It's a huge transition. You come in, whoever you are today, and you all come in as individuals and very, very different. But you all go through exactly the same experience and you feel it very differently. Because you have your own experiences and it is a huge transition, a huge change as to becoming a lawyer. So I was asked to stand up here today and talk to you about how to prepare for law school. And not how to do what you should have done 10 years ago or, or in college or anything else, but what to do in this window of time between now and starting either in August or a year from August, or, or more for some of you, but most of you hopefully will see you sitting right here in just a few months. And I'm gonna focus on some very pragmatic, practical things that you all know. They're common sense. But there's something about becoming a student again or staying a student that you all wanna check your common sense at the door. No, no, you gotta bring your common sense with you. It's gotta stay with you on this journey. Um, but before I do that, I, I kind of wanna to talk to you about a little bit about mindset. Because I really think that that is the core of, of what we have to do. So to get us all started, I gave you all some questions. And you don't have to, I'd like you all to take a minute to answer these questions. There are a bunch of true false questions. And then there are, what do you think are the essential traits for succeeding in law school? What's your biggest fear about law school? And then I asked, how do you like your coffee? I'll get you that. So if you'd all take a moment, and when you're done, if you'd pass it down, no names. I, I, I don't like to put people on the spot by asking them about their, their fears or anything else. So I let you write it down, and then I can randomly read, and no one has to take credit or feel like, because as, as I have a couple of former students in the room, I can tell you that they will attest that when someone else finally gets up the nerve to raise their hand and ask the question, Half a dozen other people had the exact same question and they're like, oh, thank you so much for asking it for me. I really, really, really appreciate that because I, I thought I would be really stupid if I asked that question that I was the only person who didn't know. And no one wants to feel like that person. So you're all really appreciative of that person who's willing to, to raise their hand. Uh, uh, professor, could, could you tell me why? Okay, so I don't do that to you on the first day. This is your first day. So I won't do that to you today. I'll let you all fill these out, and when you're done, if you would just pass them down. Uh, no, right up here. Choose, which way? Should we pass left or right? Pass left. All left handed, I like that. Your left, not mine. Okay, so, journey of a thousand days. I almost calculated it in minutes or seconds, but that was going to get too overwhelming, so I, I did. Um, so I'm focused on that. Journey of a thousand days. Now, as you're passing those in, those true false statements. Those true false statements, what do you think about them? What do you think about them? All false, most of the false? Some of them maybe true? About one true. When I got asked to do this, I um, asked all my students, and um, I uh, keep in touch with all my former students on Facebook. When you graduate, you can friend me on Facebook, and then I follow your life, and, and you get to ask me questions, etc., which is really cool. So I posted the other day saying, okay, I'm doing this presentation, and you all need to tell me what do they need to know to prepare for law school in this short window? You know, what, what should they be doing? And as I said, I'm going to come back to all the common sense stuff. But what really, really impressed me about what they said is that I need to disabuse some myths. So I started looking, what are the myths about law school? There are lots of them, right? These are a couple that, that, that I thought were pretty, pretty common. And most of you seem to have recognized the risks, the, the myths, but not all of you. And so I want to disabuse a couple of myths. And I want 
want you to think about why you thought some of these myths might be true. Those of you who knew they weren't true, I'm going to tell you why they're not true, and that's always good to reinforce correct information. So in looking at it, it's about, the first one was the first year of law school is basically the fifth year of college. Now, almost every law student who goes directly from college to law school is under that misimpression. I've gotten from college just fine. This is just the, you know, the extension, no problem. It's different. We'll talk about how in a minute. Law school exams are just like college exams. Absolutely, positively not. And that's a really hard one. Now, for some of you, college exams were a while ago. So that's not really a big deal because you don't really remember them. But it is important in thinking about how you're gonna go about attacking the semester and planning everything else. Because generally speaking, a, a large percentage of your grade, in some classes your entire grade, is based on that final exam. Now, in most of our classes there are some midterms or some projects or stuff, but not all. If it worked for me in college, it will work for me in law school. Maybe but definitely not true. For a couple people, maybe. If I know the law, I will succeed. Guys, in today's day and age of the internet, anyone can get on the web and search the law. It's not memorizing the law, and let me be really clear. Memorization, internalizing, knowing that law, bare bones minimal. You can't get past day two without knowing that you are gonna know that law. Because you have to know the law to be able to use it. And that's why you're in law school. I will learn all the law I need in law school. Well, let me tell you, my father's been practicing for over 50 years, and I promise you, half the law he needs wasn't in existence when he was in law school. Because he does a lot of commercial real estate stuff and, and, and banking stuff, and those regulations didn't even exist. So no. That's not true either. Law professors spend their time writing and don't want to deal with students. At some schools, yeah. Not here. That's one of the things I love about this school, and that's one of the reasons I moved to this school, because that's important to me. And law school can be an exciting and enjoyable experience. Absolutely. I am not going to tell you it's going to be fun every step of the way, and I will admit to you, come exam time, you're likely to be feeling a little bit of stress, and not sure why in God's name you did this. But that's generally fleeting. So, and you guys look pretty good in knowing the kinds of things you need to do to succeed in law school. So, I want to turn now for just one second, and I'd like you all to turn and introduce yourself to someone you don't know. who I met on that first day of law school many, many, many years ago. Yes, we're into the third decade, so we're up to three minutes. Okay, so, now just think to yourself, how does that person take their coffee? Pardon? How does that person take their coffee? Now, guys, don't ask the person. Don't ask the person. You're not supposed to ask the person. I did this for a reason. How many of you immediately sort of said, I had no 
clue. I need to ask. How many of you just sort of guessed? How much of life do you think we go around just sort of filling in the blanks? The great story is about online dating. If anyone has ever had the privilege or the pleasure of this, I have a friend who's a professor of anthropology and she studied it, and she talked about the fact that people would fill in the missing pieces based on just what they'd read or a picture. It's human nature, it's what we do. We make assumptions. We have blind spots, we don't see things we don't wanna see. We have preconceived notions. And the hardest part of law school, and here's the real truth of the matter, is not learning the law or learning to use the law. It's learning to recognize some of those preconceived notions and prior knowledge and information that we bring with us, don't even think about, and then it conflicts with what we're trying to learn and trying to do. It's such an easy example. And we all make those. How do I take my coffee? Any guesses? <laughs> okay, well, we got the budget. How many people think I take my coffee black? Sweet. Light. Sweet and light. I don't drink coffee. That's what I said. <laughs> Guys, this is what I drink. They still make it and I still drink it. It's the first diet soda from the 80s. Yes, I, I still drink it, they still make it. Anyway, but it's interesting because we all go around and make judgments, assumptions. You have to, guys. You have to wake up in the morning. You have to make 100 assumptions to get out of bed and believe the air is breathable and the gravity is going to keep your feet on the floor. So it's perfectly normal. But once you decide to enter this 1,000-day journey to becoming a lawyer, you've got to be able to start recognizing and questioning your assumptions. And that goes about some very basic things about what is law school. What do I have to do to succeed in law school? And am I really doing it? Now, who has heard that law school is a lot of reading? Now, how many of you did a lot of reading in college? So a lot of reading isn't a problem, right? No, it's not. How many of you read primary sources for your hundreds of pages of reading in college? Many few of you. You didn't read the history compilation. You didn't read the science book or the textbook. You read raw data. That's what cases and statutes are. They're the raw data. In law school, you don't get to read the book that synthesizes it all for you. It's not 200 pages up here. Let me tell you about all the different things that happened and how we've interpreted them. You get to go back and read the original source, the case, and decide how do we interpret that? What does that mean? So people think, oh, I'm used to reading a lot, no problem. I know I can read 100 pages in 100 minutes and, and retain it. Most people, now look, there are always the exceptions to the rule, and I hope that you are them, but most people need to spend a lot longer, at least initially, learning how to deal with the primary source, not the synthesized source. And people don't think about it that way. They think, oh, I just have 100 pages of reading to do. But it's what are you reading and what do you need to pull out of it? Now, going back to what I was talking about in the difference between law school and college, is that in college, it was often, for many of you, sufficient if you had done all the reading and gone to class or gotten notes from someone, you could go into the exam and regurgitate back enough to do well, right? That was sufficient. In law school, that is never going to be sufficient because we are not looking for regurgitation. You are going to be the lawyer. You are going to be the person faced with the next fact scenario, not the one that's already been decided. They don't need you for that. That's done. They need you for the next one. And so you have to be able to read and understand all that went before so that you can apply it to the next scenario. That you can see, oh my God, this is what's important and this is where I'm going to apply that or that. Or this is just like that. 
And some people joke sometimes and say, you learned everything you need to know to succeed in law school in Sesame Street, because three of these things are not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. <laughs> but in many respects, you all did. You all have every single basic skill you need to succeed in law school. But you need to be willing to look at the skills you have and realize you might need to hone them a little differently apply them a little differently. And you have to be willing to have an honest conversation with yourself, no one else, and say, am I really doing what I need to do? Have I really planned? Okay, so let me talk about some of the both pragmatic and more mental aspects of this. In the next few months before you come to law school, it is imperative that you get yourself situated, okay? At least the first year, first semester at least, is one of the most challenging periods of many people's lives. I, I see former students in the back shaking their head, yes. Now, I don't know if, if this is Murphy's Law and that somehow as soon as they know you're going to law school, things start happening, or if it's just when you add on top of everything you're already doing, the stress of law school, it becomes an issue. So you need to kind of clear the decks at least warn the people who you've always been there for 24 seven, that um, things might change a little bit. People are very resistant to change. You ever notice that? People don't like change. Well, you know what? Most of us don't like change. But we have to consciously say things have got to change a little bit if I'm going to make this an enjoyable, exciting, challenging, and successful experience. Because you can make it a successful experience and then be a little grayer or balder. Thank you to my hairdresser. You all can't see it, but it's it, grayer or balder from it. You know, I, I, housing. I can't tell you the number of people who think they can move into their new place the day or week before law school. I know it's probably more economical, but you need to feel situated. It's more than just where you're going to live and where the drugstore is and where the grocery store is, because you're going to need food and occasionally a Tylenol. You need to have your books and your laptop. And guys, let me tell you right now, you need to have a backup system. Okay, who has backed up their computer in the last week? Good, better than most. The rest of you, are you waiting for the blue screen of death? Yes. <laughs> well, let me tell you that invariably, I've had students have their, lap, their backpack stolen the day before the writing thing was due or their computer crashed, or they spilled something on the, the mats, which don't do well with liquid, um, despite the commercials. Um, anyway, so you need to have it all in a row. It's part of being organized. Now, think about it. Just stop and think about this. Who wants to hire a disorganized lawyer? Who wants to hire a mediocre lawyer? Well, as I see no takers, we all have to be pretty outstanding organized lawyers, don't we? Law, your legal professionalism, starts on day one of law school. It doesn't wait three years. You begin practicing the day you start. So, you're good at books. You're gonna have your books beforehand. Guys, law school is not like college. We have assignments the first day. We dive right in. Okay? You are not going to get to come to class and spend 50 or 75 minutes saying, well, welcome to class. We're very excited to have you. We're, we're, you know, we're, this is what we're going to be doing. Yes, sir? No, my dad was throwing up the news sign. I'm sorry? My dad was just... Oh, oh, you were waiting. Okay. <laughs> uh, thought someone was raising their hand. Okay. And guys know when and where. You know, you should be in a place, walking to law schools, figuring out where your classes are, when things are, you know, beforehand. So that you feel more comfortable. Because how many people think they might feel a little bit of butterflies in the stomach, a little bit of trepidation, a little bit of lack of sleep the night before the first day? Guys, I still get it. The night before the first day of classes, I always get a little angsty. And I've been, I've been coming to the first day of law school for over 25 years. Okay, so you gotta get ready. And to get ready, you need to come to law school rested. It's easy to start good habits and instill them as good habits before you get here. It's really hard when your body is under stress. And guys, stress is a physiological response. Okay? It is hardwired into our bodies. And you want a little bit of stress. Let me be clear about that. They've done the studies. There is an optimum amount of stress. Now, everyone's optimum is a little different. 
Too little stress, you're not motivated enough to do it. Too much stress, you're not doing it productively. You want to be just right. Like the porridge. Okay, so take some time in the weeks before law school to relax, to clear your plate, to clear your head, to, to go on that trip you really wanted to do, to, to read a novel. People love To Kill a Mockingbird, for example. There's one that inspires, but is it necessarily too much law? Some people say, oh, well, I should go and take one of these prep classes where I learn everything I'm going to learn in the first year. And for some people, that is a good thing. But for most, I say, you don't need to. You'll only be confused. They'll focus on something different than your professor wants to focus on. They're expensive often. I mean, you can. They can be interesting. But it's not what I would recommend you do for your first part. I recommend that you spend some time talking to yourself being what I will call reflective, being really honest with yourself. One of the things I will suggest you do is that you think about how do you learn? How do you like to take in information? And um, how do you like to, um, how do you like to um, process it? We hope that we can do things in, in ways that appeal to all of you, but invariably it doesn't work that way. Magic. Um, we love when magic works. Sometimes technology does, sometimes it doesn't. I'm going to post a website to something called VARK, B-A-R-K. You can just search VARK, it's fine. I love this. It's a 16 question questionnaire, it's free. And on it, you get to decide, uh, find out what your learning preferences are, and it offers you some study trips about how you might like to study, how you might like to intake information and output information as you do it. So that's one of the ways you get to start to stop and think about how do I learn? How does it work for me? I think it's heating up. We'll see if it comes on. I'll spell it out if not. So I think that the best way to spend the time is thinking about how do I learn? How do I process things? How do I, there we go. How do I deal with things? What is my plan? The number of graduates I spoke to who said time management is one of the absolute core issues, that things often take longer than they expect in the first year. And you have to be honest enough with yourself to realize that they might to plan for it. If you think I have always been able to read 60 pages in an hour, Therefore, that's all I need to a lot. And then it turns out it takes you two hours the first month or two. You haven't planned appropriately, and you're going to run into issues. Being reflective. A lot of people I've talked to come to law school scared. Scared of failure. Scared they won't do as well as they think they should do. Scared of the uncertainty. Scared of the expense. Scared of the prospects. Scared. Well, I'm a big proponent of feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Yeah, law school is an expensive and major undertaking. But a law degree vests you with such potential and power and ability to go and make a difference in the very individual ways that you will all go out there and make a difference. And yes, it's stressful and hard. But I don't know about you, I found that most things in life worth having do tend to have their share of stress and challenge. If it were easy, anyone could do it. Perseverance and resilience are probably the other two traits that I would say are most important. And I brought along my favorite book, which sits on my bookshelf every day. For those in the back who can't see, it's the little engine that could. That's my mantra. Think I can, I think I can, I know I can. Well, we know you can too. You just have to want it. Be honest with yourself and plan for it. 
I am going to run out of time, and Dean Conte wants to speak with you all before you move on to the next, but I'll hang out for a little bit for people who have questions, and I am always available via the UDC website, my email, debra, D-E-B-R-A dot Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, at UDC dot E-D-U. Do tell me that you were here at the session and follow up with any questions you have. I will try to get back to you as quickly as possible. Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you all in contract soon. UDC.edu. D-E-B-R-A, though. I don't spell it the biblical way. I spell D-E-B-R-A. But you can find me on the website. I'm listed there. You don't have to remember that. You can go click on it when you need it. The thing that you haven't heard today is how special you are. This country, frankly, does not need merely more lawyers. It needs change agents. We are dealing in a period of history in the fastest rate of change that's ever been experienced by our species. Law is the tool that human beings use to protect the things they have created, but to mediate and accommodate and absorb change which must be changed. You look at the newscasts any day and you understand how fast the world is changing whether it's the digital world or whether it's the international world or whether it's something called employment and jobs and the future of work all of that is changing the folks who will have to become the architects of that change historically lawyers have been doing that for a long long time you may have heard of about a document called the Constitution of the United States, okay? That was drafted primarily by lawyers. If you look at who's in the legislature, who's in Congress, it's primarily lawyers. We speak a private language. But Charles Houston, who, who sort of designed the pathway that led to Brown versus the Board of Education said, lawyers are either social parasites or social architects. This is the place where you become a social architect. And let me just simply say, I want you here because I want people who care about that role, who understand the precious, really, trust that we've been given to use the law. Because, you know, we have a monopoly on access to the courts. That comes with the law license. But you don't get a monopoly, I don't, you shouldn't get a monopoly, if you're not advancing a public trust. And we have a public trust to do something that the Constitution mentions called established justice. And so I just didn't want you to leave here without understanding that what you bring to this place is as important as what you will take from this place. The who you are, to the best of my knowledge, nobody was born the day before they started law school, okay? You have lived lives, you know worlds, you know about change, you know about tragedy and you know about joy. And we need you to share that knowledge because we really are a community. And let me just give you an example of some of the ways in which our students and this school have helped to become social architects. This is the place where when we found out that 54% of all African-American males in the District of Columbia between the ages of 18 and 35 were either in prison, parole, probation, or a warrant was out for their arrest. When we said, when I went to the Chief Judge of the Superior Court and said, you're running the, the most efficient uh, sort of pipeline to the adult correctional system in your juvenile justice system, and he gave us authorization to set up a youth court where teenagers are the jurors and where teenagers have authority to sentence their peers to community service, to an apology, to restitution, but they also sentence them to jury duty. So that, and you'll hear more about this in the first week of class, but in fact what that means is that they, that, they, that these are the bad kids. They're not good kids judging bad kids. They are, they are true peers. They have reduced recidivism from 
35% to 6%. So the bad kids are a force for the rule of law that we have intact. In other schools, and we're trying to embed it in our schools, we have schools in Ward 7 and 8 and Ward 6 where not even 50% of the kids move from third grade to fourth grade able to read. So I've sent in first year students to find unemployed teachers. They're called fifth graders. And I put the fifth graders to work teaching the second and third graders how to read. And they do a better job than many of the remediation teachers because those kids want the attention and approval of an older kid faster. This is a way of thinking about how do we create new solutions. You won't find this in the law books. You're going to have to go to other disciplines to learn about what are evidence-based, what are proven, what are validated. This is a school where we found out that we have a school of Baloo where you have 1,100 students and had 1,500 suspensions the year before last. Something suggests that they don't go home and read the Encyclopedia Britannica. And so you, uh, you heard one of the students who's leading the charge that will lead to a moratorium on school suspensions over the next couple of years. Other of our students know about <clears throat> something called Benefit Check Software, which is a software system that you will be taught to use in the first week if you want to, to go and help people get their benefits because it will print out, when you put in certain data, it will print out all the benefits that they're entitled to, but it's not enough to give them a sheet. You'll have to go and walk down with them and make the application. All I'm saying is you're needed here to make justice available. And justice is not available, as I said before, I don't know many lawyers who can afford a lawyer. We need to change the system. <laughs> you need to be architects of that change. And this school is about you're becoming an architect. This school is about justice, but it's about justice in a very peculiar sense that you'll hear me talk about the first week of law school. Because my father was a legal philosopher, and he told me that he didn't think we could ever understand justice. It was too perfect, too absolute, too platonic. But that he thought we were all born with an innate sense of injustice, a response to disparities that were intolerable. And so he defined justice as the process of either preventing or remedying whatever would arouse our sense of injustice. That's the definition of justice you'll learn at least in your first couple weeks at this school and I think will take you through all three years. It's a definition of justice that they haven't heard about as I'm finding out at Stetson, at Southwestern, at Harvard or at Yale, but they will or they have already in the past couple weeks. And I'm hoping to see you in a few in a few months and I'm looking forward to that. But I do want to say you are, each one of you, a very special gift to this class and I do want to warn you that each one of you will be required to come to a pizza party at my house <laughs> so that if, if, you, if you have problems with bread, we'll make a, a arrangements for that. But I want to hear who you are and your life story. As I said, you don't have to go prenatal, but I want to know who you are. Thank you.